Thank you for the privilege of speaking to you all throughout this last week. And I want to give thanks to the Lord and to you for your very gracious and kind hospitality. The thing that keeps coming to my mind during this last week is how that you people think of everything. Every little detail um, been gracious in so many ways, so thoughtful. Thank you for being that way towards my family, and thank you for letting my family come. You could have just invited me to speak and uh, just have me come, but instead you had my whole family come, and we got to enjoy camp together and be here with you and spend some time at the zoo too together and enjoy that. And we get to enjoy fellowship with all of you together, so thank you for all of these good things. I believe I've had more different kinds of food and more food in the last week than I've ever had before. So we'll see what that does to me later. I was thinking as we were singing, um, you have had to tolerate my American accent all of this time. And not only do I have an American English accent, but I also had the Chicago nasal kind of accent that my wife makes fun of. She's from the south and she speaks a certain way and I'm from the north and speak a certain way. So let's open up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We have had the privilege together to at camp think through many of the different ways that God has extended great grace to us. We meditated together on the riches of God's grace and how God has lavished his people, overwhelmed his people with grace. And Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3 just gives example after example after illustration of how God gives great grace to his people. We were deserving only God's wrath. We were children of this world and under Satan's rule, but God in his mercy loved us and saved us because he wanted to. He made us who were not his people to become his people. He made us who were without hope and did not know God to know him and to have the hope of Christ. He purchased us with the blood of his son so that we can have forgiveness of sins. He sealed us, giving us his Holy Spirit as the down payment of the eternal inheritance that we have yet to receive. There are so many things in those chapters that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. He gave us new life. He gave us his grace to be able to change. And so you come to Ephesians chapter 4 and it says, Now it's time to start walking worthy of this great grace that you have been given. And the Apostle Paul starts giving all of these different examples of ways that we as believers in Jesus Christ need to put off our old life and put on our new life. And you have lots of different illustrations of that given in chapters 4 and 5, and we looked at those at camp. And we even looked at chapter 6 some as well. And I would like for us to meditate specifically on what Paul says to fathers. How do Christian men live out their new life in Jesus Christ as fathers? When we see Ephesians chapter 6 and we read what Paul says about fathers, we might be a little surprised because we look at chapter 6 and verse 4 and we read that and we think, now, why did Paul say this? There's so many things that if we were writing to fathers, we might have said, but Paul didn't say those things. He said this specifically in Ephesians 6. And not only that, but in Colossians chapter 3, he says the same thing. And what does Ephesians 6, 4 say? It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. 
So why does the Holy Spirit, of all the things that the Holy Spirit could have moved Paul to say, why does he say this? We talked about this a little bit at camp. I'm going to talk more about it now. What do these verses teach us? What are the implications of these words? Again, the verse, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Two commands. Do not provoke your children. And to summarize the last half of the verse, disciple your children. Do not provoke your children. And number two, fathers, disciple your children. So what are some of the things taught by this verse? What are some implications of these words? Well, number one, it is God's will that fathers take primary responsibility for the spiritual guidance of their children. Where are the mothers in this verse? Paul doesn't even address mothers. He goes straight for the fathers and speaks only to them and says, Fathers, don't provoke your children. And number two, disciple your children. Fathers, you are primarily responsible not just for the material well-being of your family and for protecting them physically, but for their spiritual lives. You are, above all other people, responsible for them. When we think back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, when God created mankind, God made man in his own image. God made man to represent him in the creation that he made on the earth, to be in his image, to be like him, to be an image of him in creation, to govern over the things that God made, to be his steward over what God made. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 1. You come to Genesis chapter 2. You see that God makes man first from the dust of the ground and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And then later, man creates Eve from the rib of Adam, and God creates Eve to be Adam's helper. And then we see in chapter 2 that those two come together in marriage physically and spiritually as one flesh. But man is obviously in the passage to be the ruler, to be the leader of the home, to be the leader of the wife, and the wife is to be the helper. But something happens in chapter 3. Satan is indwelling the serpent. The serpent tempts Eve. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from the... Why would God... Eve, why would God withhold from you the knowledge of good and evil? Eve, do you think God is holding back from you? Do you think God isn't as good as he seems to be? You should try this fruit of the tree. And Eve, who is the helper of Adam, instead of turning to Adam and looking to his leadership... She decides for herself to take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she eats it first. Adam, failing to lead and stand up to what his wife just did, turns around and does the same thing right after her. And then as they both sin, immediately they are separated from God. Immediately they both know they're naked and ashamed. Immediately God comes to find out from them, he already knew, but to ask of them, what they had done, and what do Adam and Eve do to one another? They start blame shifting. No one takes responsibility for their actions, and we see that relationships begin to be broken because of sin, right there in Genesis chapter 3. And then God tells about the curse and what all that means upon mankind because they brought sin into his creation. And one of those things is that the woman now will no longer want to be the helper of the man, but will desire his position and will try to be higher than him, and there will be strife. That's what Genesis 1 through 3 teach us in regards to relationships in marriage. But God has created man to lead the family. So when we believe on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
God is working back into us that image of himself that he created mankind with to begin with. But we lost it because of our sin. Now we're going to start changing through Jesus Christ, by God's spirit, by God's grace, to be what God created us to be originally. So once we believe on Jesus Christ as fathers, we begin to learn how to be the father that God intended us for, for us to be. We begin to learn how to be the husband that God intended for us to be. And likewise also wives as, uh, women as wives and mothers. But it is God's will that the father take primary responsibility for the spiritual guidance of his children. So let me ask you, what is the greatest obstacle for us men who are fathers to be a good father? What's the greatest obstacle? Is it Satan? Satan surely doesn't want us to be good fathers because that would illustrate the gospel and we would be bearing clearly the image of God. He certainly doesn't want that and he's certainly going to tempt us. But is he the greatest obstacle? No. How about the times in which we live? How about the demon of technology? Our, is the world the, the hardest obstacle that we face as fathers in being the father that we should be by the grace of God? No. The greatest obstacle, men, is ourselves. Our own sin is the single most greatest obstacle to being the father that God desires us to be. And it is his will that we understand and accept of him that we are responsible for our children's spiritual well-being. Now, that doesn't mean that we can make our children be Christians or that we can command their hearts to obey God, but to use our influence to teach and to train them. Number two, something else that these, this verse has to, to deal with, fathers in their own sin and weakness will fail and abuse their power and authority. Inherently in this command is the fact that men fail to do this. We all, every father has failed and will fail again at being the type of father they ought to be to represent Jesus Christ because of our own sinfulness. But we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God to become more and more that father that we are to be. These words imply that the words and actions of the father greatly impact the children. There is no human influence more powerful on the children emotionally and spiritually than the father. This does by no means take away the power and influence of the, of the impact of the mother. But there is something about when a father does not fulfill his responsibility as a man and as a husband and as a father that does something to children that when a, when a mother fails, it doesn't quite impact in the same way. You can read about this in social studies, even from secular studies, the impact of fatherless homes on children, the impact of divorce on children, which is normally the father's fault in, in the majority of the cases. How do fathers negatively affect their children? What is it that we do as fathers that can cause such a negative effect on them? Like Colossians chapter 3 says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger lest they be discouraged. What can we do as fathers that so profoundly hurt them? What kind of words and actions are included in this word provoking them to anger and wrath? Let's think about this for a minute. We've already heard from the ladies that gave testimony to their reading and to some of the messages and in their prayers, praying that men would not abuse their authority. 
This is one of the ways that we fathers fail. This is one of the ways that we hurt our children. We abuse our authority. Well, what does that mean? Dictatorial fathers that are always giving commands, always giving harsh commands, being overly demanding and having expectations that are unfair upon our children, being heavy-handed to them, over-disciplining them, over-restricting them, that kind of heavy-handedness, the abuse of our role. And of course, that can also be spoken of in the physical sense, abusing our power in ways that hopefully no believer in Jesus Christ would be involved in with their children, sexual abuse. There is verbal abuse. A man can raise his voice and use the power of his physical body in his verbal capacity to be abusive. How else might you provoke your children to wrath, to anger? By not treating them as people? There is a tendency with fathers to not really count their children as full-fledged human beings until they get to a certain age, especially when they're at the diaper training stage and all those diapers need to be changed and the fathers just disappear. I've been guilty of that one. But really, a lot of men struggle with looking at their smaller children as really true human beings. They just tend to ignore them, except when they want to play with them, until they become an older age. Not treating them as people with love, thinking that they can humiliate and shame their children with harsh speech and harsh actions on a, on a regular basis, and that it doesn't really matter because they're just children, they're just small, so it doesn't really matter. No, that can engender anger in children and resentment. How about some other ways that we might provoke our children? Treating them as though they're in the way of our life. The more materialistic a society gets, the more parents and adults look at children as in the way of a better life. And sometimes a father will begrudge time and money spent on children. This is something that I just have to do. My wife will just keep bugging me unless, until, until I take my kids out for coffee or if I don't go do something with them, my wife's going to keep bugging me about it. Impatience, impatience with our children. Men tend to struggle with impatience more than women do, just in general. And you have to say the same thing to kids how many times, men, before they finally get it? Moms, how many times you have to say the same thing over and over and over again, right? Sometimes hundreds, even thousands of times. Dads have a tendency to blow up when they have to say the same thing twice. That is so unrealistic. That is so unfair. How about God towards us, man? If God expressed his anger towards us every time he had to say something to us twice, what would our life look like? And yet we men can live in perpetual impatience and frustration with our children, exasperation with them, when they're just being kids. That's the way kids are. Do not provoke your children to wrath, to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I've already alluded to this, but men, nothing will 
provoke your children to anger and resentment more than seeing you mistreat their mother. You mistreat their mother, and they see that. They see you lift a hand against their mother. They see that. You divorce their mother. There's nothing worse you can do to them. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Work stress can be pretty heavy. Some of us deal with very high stress jobs. Sometimes financial pressure can be very heavy on our hearts. Don't take that out on your families, men. Don't take it out on your wives. Don't take it out on your children. Pray that God would help you to leave job stress at the office so that when you come home, you don't take it out on your kids. Just as we have a great power to negatively impact our children, men, we also have a great power to encourage them. If we will instruct them and nurture them in the Lord. Number three, fathers, another thing taught by this verse or implication is that fathers in their sinfulness will often fail to disciple his own children. Yes, we'll fail to and provoke them to wrath sometimes in our sin, but also we'll be tempted to fail in discipling our own children. Sometimes we just don't know how, and we think it's a lot more complicated than it is. Wow, pastor tells me I have to disciple my kids. That means I have to walk them through all these different books and sit down with them for every day for an hour and talk to them about Scripture and all this kind of stuff. No. Being a godly man and teaching our children in the normal rhythms of life and gathering our family together sometimes over God's word and prayer, teaching them as things come up in their lives, that's discipling them. Sometimes in our sinfulness, we just simply put it off. For some of us, it's almost stressful to think about discipling. Our, don't we have enough stress in our lives? Going to add that responsibility to it? Just neglect. Some of us are just lazy. We'd rather just not deal with it. Just let, let our wives do that. Just let, let them do it. There's a problem with that, man. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ he says for you to do it. And your wives are to help. And praise God, they do. But we're supposed to do this with our wives. A combined effort of discipleship of our children. For some fathers, it's just simply a priority issue. Work is just way too important to them. Recreation might be way too important to them to where they're not willing to prioritize. Some fathers are just too immature. They haven't learned to grow up and embrace their responsibilities as fathers. Sometimes we have this idea that, well, yeah, God said to disciple our children, so what I'll do is I'll make sure I go to a good church that has good kids programs. And so then the Sunday school teachers and the youth pastor and the services, that'll be the discipleship of my children. I don't really need to do anything at home because I have a good church. No. These things can certainly help. But nothing is as influential and powerful and needed as the father, the parents. Your children need you as a man more than they need your money. 
Are you giving yourself to your kids? We fail to disciple our kids, men, if we are reactionary parents. Discipleship means we're proactive. We are actively teaching our kids how to live in Christ, how to be believers, how to know God, how to live. We're teaching them these things. Reactionary parenting is you just wait for them to do something wrong, and then you discipline them. And then you deal with them then and tell them about the wrongs they committed then. But that's all you do. You react to problems. Are we to react to problems? Are we? That's not a trick question. Yes, of course we're supposed to react to problems. But that's only one part of being a dad. That's only one side of discipling, teaching, and instructing our kids. We need to instruct and teach them when they're not in trouble, not just when they're in trouble. So this is a very practical message here today. I'm just drawing on what this verse says and the implications of it in our lives. Number four, fathers can change. Fathers can change and become godly fathers by the grace of God. Amen? Amen? We can change. Those habits of bad parenting that we have had, by the grace of God, they can change. If we have been a neglectful father, that can change. God can help you do that. That's why we have the Word of God. That's why the Holy Spirit has come to indwell in you, Dad, to give you new life and to change you from the inside out. And part of that change is about how we live as fathers towards our children. And that new life and godliness by God's grace, as we grow and we change but with God's help, we will love our kids more. We will be increasingly kind towards them. We will be increasingly patient with them. We will be increasingly humble towards them. The more godly we become. Children need your godliness, dads. They need to see you changing. They don't need a perfect dad. They need a dad that loves God, that is submitted to God, and is changing and trying to grow. That's what they need to see. They need to see the gospel working in you. An ungodly man cannot be a good father. I mentioned this at the church camp, the power to be found in confession of sin. Sometimes we dads, we fail. You may have to spank one of your children because of their rebellion or something. And you might overdo it because you're angry. You give a punishment to one of your kids because of their failures in the home. And you go way overboard because you're just upset. And you're not actually being just towards them. What do you do when the Holy Spirit convicts you of that? Do you simply say, God, help me not be like that again? You confess that sin to God, then you go to that child and you say, I did wrong to you. I was sinfully angry, and I gave you punishment that was more than you deserved. I did wrong. Will you forgive me? Fathers, I would suspect that there are some of you who have never confessed a fault to your children. Not one time.
We need to be godly men who are humble about our wrongdoing so that our children can see that we're in submission to God and we're not led by our own pride. The word meekness, meekness, I've heard described as strength under control. Men, we have a certain strength that women don't have. That strength that we possess needs to be under control. Our manhood needs to be under control. And our children need to see it under control. And when we are out of control, they need to see us get back into control and confess our faults. During the church camp, we were talking about God's grace so much, I, I just said, maybe we ought to just all stand up together just to keep saying the word grace, grace, grace over and over again for about an hour. Because this is what it's all about. That's what we need. We need God's grace to help us. We can't be good dads and fathers. We can't do it. We all have limits, emotional, physical uh, limits, and we can be good to a certain point, but we all reach that line that gets crossed. And there's nothing we can do outside the grace of God when that happens. We're going to give in to our flesh. We're going to do wrong. We're going to sin. We have to have God's grace to teach us, to instruct us, to enable us. And God wants to give us that grace. This message today is not just about being a good dad so you can feel good about yourself. It's about giving pleasure to God and giving glory to God as a father. And also, the benefit of that to you is the blessing of God upon yourself as a man, that you are the father God wants you to be by his grace. And there's much blessing on your family when that happens. Last point, fathers, central to our Christian lives, is our relationship with our wives and children. There is no such thing as a godly man who doesn't have a good relationship with his wife and kids. You are fooling yourself if you think that you are a good Christian or that you're walking with the Lord if you don't have a good relationship with your children. You say, well, I have really blown it with my children. My children don't care about me. My children are angry with me. They've already left the house. I don't have a good relationship with them. It's not what, what do you need to do, men? Is it because of your failures? Is it because of things that you've said and done? If so, go to your children and talk to them about it. Confess your fault and ask them to forgive you. Restore that relationship. Your identity as a man, as a Christian, is not to be found in your job, is not to be found in your hobbies, it's to be found in your home with your wife and children. There's a very powerful Christian movie out there called Courageous. Have any of you seen that movie, Courageous? If you've seen that movie, Courageous, raise your hand. Okay, good many of you have seen it. Well, that's good. Uh, it's very American culture-based, I understand. but uh, Very good. I encourage you to watch that if you have not yet seen that. It talks about sometimes men just need to come to the point where they actually give themselves to the Lord. They give their fatherhood to God and say, God, I want to be, I consecrate, I give my being a dad to you. I want to start learning how to be a good father. Teach me. Sometimes men just have to make a decision like that before God, and they're able to begin to start growing as they ought to grow. When I was young, my parents weren't, weren't, were not yet believers in Christ. I mean very young, when I was six years old. 
there was a Sunday school bus that came through my neighborhood of a certain church, and my mom wanted us out of the house on Sunday so she could clean the house in peace. So she sent me and my brother on the Sunday school bus. And so we were on the Sunday school bus, and that was, a first, that was our first introduction to, to church, to Christian church as a family, was my brother, my brother and myself going on the bus. So we were riding the bus every Sunday, and, and then there was this uh, program for Mother's Day. Everybody bring your mothers to church. It's going to be a special Mother's Day program. And I was so excited, I went home, and I just begged my mom, would you please come to church for Mother's Day? So my mom rode the bus, and she came to church. And it was the first time she'd been. She heard a message like this, but for mothers. And sitting there as a non-Christian, the Holy Spirit really spoke to her about the fact that she was a sinner, that she was not the mother that she needed to be, that she was nowhere close, and she didn't even know how to begin. Her own sinfulness was driven home to her. Well, some time later, some other Christians were going through the neighborhood and they were knocking on doors to talk to people about the Lord. And they came to our house and my dad wasn't home, my mom was home, so she just talked to them at the door. And they preached the gospel to her and she listened. And she was very interested. Well, they invited her to church that Sunday. Well, she didn't go. My, my dad and mom talked each other out of going that Sunday. So the next week, they came again, and they said, well, we, we were looking for you at church on Sunday. You said you were going to come, and we didn't see you. Well, it just so happened to be that that week, there were evangelistic services at the church. And so they said, well, since you didn't come last Sunday, how about coming on this day when there's an evangelistic meeting? And my parents said, okay, we'll come, and they came. And they both heard the gospel in those meetings and were saved, uh, both together at that time. It may be that there's someone here today or watching or listening to this. You're listening to me talk about being a Christian dad and growing in new life in Christ and, and having God's grace help you and change you. And that is like speaking a foreign language to you. You want to be a godly dad. You want to be a good dad anyway. You don't want to fail. But you don't have a relationship with God. You've never had your own sin dealt with. You don't have new life in Christ yet. You can't pray to God and ask him to help you because you don't know God yet. Well, you need to do what my parents did when I was six years old. You need to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You need to believe on Jesus to save you from your sins so you can have forgiveness and new life in Christ so that you can begin a relationship with God that will change you from the inside out so that you can become the father that God commands you to be. Dads, is there someone here today where you might be someone that needs to make a formal commitment to God to give your fatherhood to him as an offering, and you need to actually make a formal declaration of your decision to lead your family God's way? Practical point. Men, listen to your wives. Your wives know a lot about being a good dad. If you would just listen to your wife's counsel, you'll stay out of a lot of trouble as a dad. How many times our dear wives say, Forrest, don't, 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 don't. Or you're about to say something or do something with the kids, and she's back there going. And you just need to say, hey, my wife saw something. My wife is concerned. I ought to at least think about what she's saying before I do something. That would really help us, men. 
Learn to lean on your wife's counsel. She's your helper after all. And one of the things she is to do is to help you be a good father. Unfortunately, some wives don't do that very discreetly. They lack wisdom in how they help their husbands be good fathers by shaming their husbands to, into trying to be a good father, and that is not the way to do it. That's another message. Okay. <laughs> Ask your children, men. It's a humbling thing to ask your children who are old enough, is there something that I do that really bothers you? Is there something I do that makes you sad? That's a humbling thing to listen to. Because a lot of times your kids might have something to say and they might have more than one thing to say. Praise the Lord that God is very gracious. God works through our parenting as believers in Christ, and God helps us, but we will never be what we should be, could be, because we're growing ourselves in Christ. But God is so gracious. But men, when your children look at you as a dad, what do they see? Do they see a man who is growing in godliness and striving to change, who loves God and is trying to serve God, who fails but then gets back up again and does right by the grace of God, that confesses sin? Or do they look at a man full of pride who doesn't ever admit he's wrong, that has the same sinful habits year after year, doesn't grow, doesn't change, do they look at you? Do they see a hypocrite who looks really good on Sunday? People respect the dad that they think they know, but the child is thinking to themselves, if they knew my dad like I knew him, they wouldn't respect him that way. What do your parents, what do your kids see in you, dads? This is a very soul-searching kind of a message to us all as fathers. A lot of us have our kids sitting here hearing this. What are they thinking about you as they hear me speaking about you and to you? How is it that we as individual men need to respond to this? Young people or older adults that are not yet fathers who hope to be, may this be a strong exhortation to you start thinking about what kind of home you will strive, strive to lead by the grace of God. Let's pray. We give praise to you this morning, Lord, that your throne of grace is available to your people and that you give grace to help in time of need every time we ask. We give praise to you that your grace is sufficient to meet our needs in every circumstance. We thank you that your grace is abundant at all times if we trust in it. Lord, we're so often foolish in our sinfulness. We trust to our own thoughts, our own strength, I pray that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to know quickly when we stray from you so that we might hurriedly run back to your will of grace and draw from its waters that we might be enabled by you again to walk in new life. Help us to grow and change. I pray that there would be no men here this morning who are fathers that will harden their hearts to these truths. 
I pray for a spirit of brokenness, a spirit of humility. For Jesus' sake, but also for the children's sake. Help your people, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.